Pixel Pipes is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Check out the official Pixel Pipes store, where you'll find logo tees as well as this Pixel Pipes mouse pad. Perfect for complementing your retro build. Click the link in the description below and help support the content you enjoy here at Pixel Pipes. For years, NVIDIA enjoyed a position of privilege amongst the elite in the computer hardware industry. Their graphics cards ruled supreme over all others, their hands calloused from the work of their grave digging, burying the corpses of their fallen competitors. Their last victim, 3DFX, was still fresh in the ground, picked clean of everything useful, and then erased from existence, leaving behind only the memories held by their devotees. But then, on July 18, 2002, something happened that would change everything in the PC gaming landscape forever. Something that would see NVIDIA swallowed by defeat, desperately clawing its way back to the limelight it was accustomed to. And that change would come from a humble Canadian company named ATI. On that date, ATI announced their next generation of graphics technology, the Radeon 9700 Pro. While previous efforts from ATI grasped fervently for the performance crown, only to falter for one reason or another, the R300 GPU would snatch it indisputably. As one reviewer put it, there's a new king in town, and it's the Radeon 9700. For 2002, it decimated all that came before, and its competition was nowhere to be seen. NVIDIA's refresh of the GeForce 3 architecture, capped at the top by the GeForce 4 Ti4600, was decidedly last generation technology by comparison. Four pixel pipes were not going to cut it anymore. DirectX 8 support was not going to cut it anymore. The next generation was assuredly here, and everything else before could only shrink in its shadow. This was a turning point for ATI. No longer were they playing second fiddle to the incumbent of the industry. This time, they were leading it, and NVIDIA had now found themselves on the defense. It was their move to make, and rebuffing ATI's cutting-edge assault would be no easy task, even for a longtime champion. What ATI had produced was a firestorm of innovation and speed. In effect, a revolution was started, and its flag bearer was the Radeon 9700 Pro. ATI is really pushing the envelope of technology with the R300. Some of the capabilities that's going to offer uh, will allow us to do things for the, for the first time that we've, we've never seen before. ATI went all out with the Radeon 9700 Pro and really surprised NVIDIA. Obviously, it is a very well-known card in ATI's history, probably one of their more highlight uh, of their early uh, years, at least anyway. Everything on this card is simply fantastic. In 3D games, it performs extremely well. So when we first got our hands on the R300, we're looking at how fast it goes, how crisp and clean the image is. This is a card that we would absolutely recommend to anyone who wanted the state of the art in rendering technology on their PC. And it's being obviously seen, you know, with sort of, sort of rose tinted glasses in a way of being just one of these most ultimate video cards from that era. All in all, this is an awesome graphics card and a reminder of a time when ATI wasn't just able to compete, but had the world's fastest video card that money could buy. Overall, without a doubt, this is a kick-ass product. The 
Radeon 9700 Pro changed everything we knew about the GPU. It spearheaded the introduction of Microsoft's new DirectX 9 standard, the first to break free from the fixed function approximated math that had started the 3D accelerator industry ever since a handful of ex-SGI employees first brought professional real-time 3D rendering into the home. This new standard would bring about true floating point calculations, true programmability, and the promise of cinematic effects into the interactive medium. It also changed how the rendering process would be done. The future was wider execution, more pipes, and higher bandwidth. In both regards, ATI had doubled it. A 107 million transistor monster that pumped more pixels onto the screen faster than any visual processor previously made. The story of the Radeon 9700 Pro starts in February of 2000. ATI had just acquired a company based in Palo Alto, California called ArtX. ArtX was a graphics chip design company founded in 1997 by 20 ex-SGI employees led by Dr. Wei Yen. Dr. Yen had previously been the head of Nintendo operations at SGI, a division responsible for the development of the Reality coprocessor used in the Nintendo 64 for generating graphics. Since its formation, ArtX set out to create cutting-edge integrated graphics using the technology and skills acquired from working with Nintendo. Its first product would be for Acer, a company that had been one of their initial backers. Acer's subsidiary ALI was a popular chipset maker in the late 90s and would use ArtX's new graphics engine in the Aladdin 7 chipset, notable for being the first integrated graphics to implement a geometry engine. While it didn't prove very popular as a chipset, it was compelling enough to catch the eye of many prospective buyers. Among offers from S3 and Nvidia, it was ATI that ultimately won a deal for their acquisition, to the sum of 400 million in stock and options. For ATI, it was a neat fit. They wanted a presence in Silicon Valley, and ArtX was headquartered just a mile away from Nvidia's home in Santa Clara. The team soon ballooned to 70 members, and a change in ATI's strategy quickly took shape with the former ArtX site taking the lead. As one person put it at the time, the center of gravity for ATI has definitely shifted from Canada to California. Their first order was to finish a new project for Nintendo. After the N64, Nintendo had left SGI, choosing instead to follow its members to their new startup, and while a contract had been penned with ArtX and much of the work had already been done, ATI's acquisition meant that all the finishing touches would be done under the purview of Team Red. Nintendo's upcoming GameCube would be powered by the Flipper GPU, and thanks to the buyout, every console produced would be branded with ATI's logo. The veteran PC chipmaker had effectively entered the console market. Former members of ArtX would soon take leadership of development under ATI for their next generation of products. Former President David Orden was named President and Chief Operating Officer of ATI. Former Head Greg Buckner was made Vice President of Engineering. Joe Macri was named Director of Technology, and Dr. Wei Yen joined ATI's Board of Directors. Their next graphics chip, the R300, would not set out to simply be the best for a given die size. It set out to be the best, period. ATI would speed up time to market by embracing the tried and true 150 nanometer process that had been used in the previous generation chips. They'd also utilize existing memory technology, DDR and a BGA form factor, instead of the newly launched DDR2 memory developed by Samsung. In order to get the best performance possible, they'd simply push to extract the most out of each. Built around an 8 pipeline design, the new R300 GPU would be the widest parallel execution core yet in the graphics industry, trouncing the 4 pipe standard of older flagships seen over the past 3 years. Geometry processing would also be twice as wide, with 4 vertex shaders total, while memory bandwidth would be dramatically increased by utilizing a 256 bit interface, leaping the traditional 128 bit bus seen on graphics cards of the past several years. They were nearly the first to launch with such a memory interface, beaten only by Matrox's Parhelia a couple of months earlier. It would utilize the latest ADEX HGP standard, which had previously debuted with variants of NVIDIA's GeForce 4 line earlier that year, and it would be the first GPU to be fully compliant with Microsoft's new DirectX 9 standard. The first public debut for the new R300 GPU would be a covert one. At E3 2002, id Software set up a small theater room at the Activision booth, showing off a demo for their much-teased sequel to their venerable FPS franchise, Doom. The question on everyone's mind, however, was, what hardware were they using? 
While the engine powering Doom 3 was originally shown in 2001 at the Macworld event running on Nvidia's GeForce 3, the demo at E3 the following year was assuredly not. Later in August, id Software would host QuakeCon, with the title sponsor being none other than ATI. It was at that point the cover had been fully lifted. The hardware of choice for id's next generation title was ATI's Bridion 9700 Pro. Id Software's lead programmer John Carmack heaped praise on ATI's new chip, claiming it was a hundred times faster than the first Radeon. Uh, through the development of Doom, we've been working closely with ATI to make sure that all three generations of their applicable products are going to have good support for the game, and we're working closely with their driver writers to make sure that we get optimal performance out of the hardware. The R300 is an ideal rendering target for the Doom engine. It can do both our highly complex pixel shaders for light surface interactions, and it can very rapidly render all the stencil shadow volumes, which deal with all of our dynamic masking away of light operations. 3D accelerators are all about performance, quality, and flexibility, and the R300 breaks new ground over anything that's come before it in all three areas. While many assumed NVIDIA's response to the R300, dubbed the NV30, would definitely be faster, the fact is, ATI was ready to show theirs off, and NVIDIA wasn't. For ATI, this was the best marketing they could have hoped for. Looking at the card, it's almost hard to imagine what a beast it truly was just based on outside appearances. The card was fairly simple, physically speaking, with a short PCB and a very modest heatsink and fan, clad in black, which contrasted nicely with the new red solder mask, setting it apart from all previous cards produced by ATI. There was one important difference, though. That small white floppy style external power connector on the back, which I just learned as of this writing, is known as the Burr connector. Interesting. This was the only physical indication of the raw power contained within. Up to this point, no other graphics card actually required external power. Some card manufacturers, such as Canopus, had power connectors on their card as part of their custom design, but the 9700 Pro included it in its reference design, and all cards released by manufacturers would follow suit. Attempting to boot the computer without it will result in a message on the screen telling you that you done messed up and nothing more will happen until you turn off the system and rectify your mistake. The card officially released alongside its non-pro brother on August 19, 2002, with the top card being priced at $399. The core was clocked at a modest 325 MHz, only marginally higher than Nvidia's GeForce 4 Ti4600, and yet its memory was actually clocked slower at 620 MHz. The difference was, of course, that the Radeon 9700 Pro was built with width in mind, not speed, which actually made it speedier. Instead of relying on a multi-texturing engine that had become a staple of past architectures from multiple graphics chip makers, each pipeline would only have a single texturing unit. This meant that older style games relying on multi-texturing effects wouldn't see peak performance, but by including more pipes, the R300 could pack more pixel shading performance, which meant future games doing more of their effects with shading would, in theory, perform much better. Fill rates and bandwidth compared to both NVIDIA's flagship of that year, as well as ATI's own previous flagship, were dramatically higher thanks to the 8-pipe and 256-bit memory design. You can see here that in my testing, the 9700 Pro easily doubles, or even more than doubles, the performance of the Radeon 8500 in some cases. On average, it scores about 55% more in 1% lows, and 69% faster in average frame rates. Nice. Aside from performance improvements, the 9700 Pro also improved on features in a variety of ways. The Radeon 8500 never had fully functional multi-sampling AA, which the new successor rectified. The 8500 also couldn't do trilinear filtering while also doing anisotropic filtering, which again the new card could. But the biggest improvement came from what ATI dubbed the Smart Shader 2.0 engine, a major upgrade from the DirectX 8.1 based shading engine of the previous generation R200 GPU. Thank you.
the R300's shitting horsepower was unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. Quite literally, as no game could even utilize the pixel and vertex shading capabilities of the chip when it first launched. Microsoft wouldn't even release an update for Windows XP with DirectX 9 support until December, and of course the games lagged significantly behind that. But owners could get their first taste of the new technology thanks to a series of demos ATI released to show off its new hardware. These demos were, simply put, some of the best ever released by the company, and many, especially Pipe Dream, are fondly remembered to this day by PC gamers who were there to see it. Of course, once the games did start to release with DirectX 9 support, it became evident that ATI's hardware was the definitive choice for running it. Nvidia's GeForce FX line, which was late to the market by several months, had shown marginally better performance over the 9700 Pro in contemporary games based on older rendering techniques. But once developers moved on to the newest technology, a vast gulf between the two companies began to emerge. Nvidia would resort to driver trickery in an attempt to bridge the gap, which didn't go unnoticed by the gaming press and public, and the resulting harm inflicted on their reputation only meant that ATI would stand even taller, delivering on image quality that gamers grew to trust. For more on the folly of the GeForce FX series, check out my older video going into detail on that. But what would surprise many is the longevity of ATI's Radeon 9700 Pro. Despite being their first entry into the DirectX 9 era, the card would go on to run games three years after it launched with astonishing gusto. In contrast with modern times, the graphics card market in these days moved at a frantic pace, with flagships being obsoleted within as little as two years, meaning the Radeon 9700 Pro was exceptional for standing the test of time. It was also the card that truly ushered in the era of anti-aliasing and anisotropic filtering. These days it's hard to imagine running a game without these features, but in 2002, gamers were accustomed to seeing crippled performance whenever those features were turned on. Not so in the case of the Radeon 9700 Pro, with true multi-sampling AA support and enough memory bandwidth and pixel fill rate to back it up. Later drivers would even add support for adaptive AA, which addressed aliasing inside of alpha textures. What the Radeon 9700 Pro accomplished for ATI is difficult to articulate. It was a turning point for the company. They had, without question, the best performing graphics card available, and that was only the beginning. Later generations based on the fundamentals of the R300 would go on to win battle after battle against Nvidia, affirming ATI's stronghold in the age of DirectX 9. They would remain the performance leaders until the debut of DirectX 10 and the ensuing upheaval that that would usher in. For the PC gaming landscape, it was nothing short of a revolution, a shift from what was known in favor of something altogether new. Games with shader effects would completely change how graphics looked, and ATI would find itself powering consoles built around those effects, helping to revolutionize the medium on that front as well. As a PC gamer in the early 2000s, the Radeon 9700 Pro represented the sort of aspirational hardware that young people like me could only dream of. I did eventually manage to get a hold of one in 2004, still considered a very good performer at that time, before quickly replacing it with the G4 6800. I have fond memories surrounding the card, and even beyond the impact it had on the broader industry, its effect on me personally represents the things I remember most fondly about my early years of PC gaming. I mean, who else besides me would be crazy enough to carry the card around on vacation 16 years later just to film it against scenic backdrops? This wasn't just a great graphics card from ATI. It is truly one of the greatest of all time. And part of that has as much to do with the failure of its competition as it does the success of the design and execution of the card itself. Had Nvidia not have stumbled as much as they did, history may not have remembered the Radeon 9700 Pro as the legend it became. I felt it was important to try to honor this amazing piece of consumer technology with a video going in depth on its history. This is also my entry for GPU June, and during this event, dozens of other channels are also contributing awesome videos which are well worth your time. You can find a link to the playlist down below, so be sure to check that out before you leave. Thanks for watching. I'm Nathan, and this has been Pixel Pipes. A very warm thanks goes out to my YouTube membership supporters. I'd like to give a very special shout out to my shader level supporters especially. 50 Shades of Beige, Cutting Edge Retro, and Sucra. Thank you guys for being so awesome. 
If you'd like to support Pixel Pipes directly, there's no better way than to join my membership. Click the join button under this video and help the channel continue bringing the content you enjoy.